Good morning from Stanford University. My name is Will Chu. I'm the faculty co-director of the StorageX Initiative. I'm also a professor in the Department of Material Science and Engineering. Welcome back to StorageX seminar series. This is our first seminar series in the year of 2022. So a belated happy new year to everyone around the world. So to kick off 2022, I'm really delighted to be hosting this seminar uh, with uh, Professor Yi Tui. As most of us know, the battery revolution was started in the early 90s due to the requirements from consumer electronics, later on by mobile electronics and computers. And for the past 10 years, we have saw huge um, drivers from the electric vehicle market. And many of us are asking what is coming next? And one of the key technologies driving battery innovations today is electric flight. And today uh, we have gathered an exceptional uh, cohort of innovators who are disrupting the electric aviation market, not only from the battery side, but also from the planes themselves. And one thing that is extremely important to recognize is that innovating for this very demanding market requires integration all the way from the battery materials to the battery cells, to the battery packs, and then to the planes themselves. And for that reason, we have invited um, three innovators to join us today to talk about all that, and then try to link everything together. And we'll have three speakers, as I mentioned. Um, first, we'll have Richard Wang, who is uh, the founder and CEO of Kuberg. And Kuberg uh, is developing battery technologies at the materials level. And I'll let E introduce Richard just in a second. And then our second speaker uh, is Herman Wigman, who is uh, the co-founder of Beta Technologies. And we have our third speaker, who is Omar um, Boyohai, uh, who is the founder and CEO of Eviation. So E, why don't you get us started um, by introducing Richard. Well, thank you. Uh, I'd like to add my welcome to everybody into the new year. Uh, it's going to be an exciting one. Hopefully there will be a lot of in-person meetings we can do, but we will continue our uh, symposium online to uh, capture the audience uh, worldwide. It is my great honor to introduce Richard Wang. Um, the reason is Richard was my PhD student, a really outstanding one. Uh, I remember Richard joining Stanford from, uh, for graduate school uh, after finishing in Caltech uh, as a top student. Uh, he came to the lab uh, with NDS EG fellowship. And Richard and I talk and what project uh, he wants to work on. Uh, we sat on uh, this open framework uh, Prussian blue type of structure. Well, Richard has done uh, a number of seminar works to uh, you know, demonstrate this open framework could be very exciting as battery materials. Well, during this process, Richard always has interest to explore, well, what's the really big impact he can make to the whole society? Well, Richard went out to do, well, he did an intern in Tesla and then later, together with uh, my other uh, postdoc, uh, Mara pa Pasta, uh, they cook on the idea, you know, supported by uh, Tomcat Center here at Stanford uh, to start Kubrick. Uh Later, well, this will also get uh, incubated in the Cyclotron world a little bit more. Uh, Richard served as the CEO and really took uh, Cuba to the next level. Uh, many of uh, you have seen the recent announcement, uh, the uh, acquired Cuba by uh, Northward. Uh, Richard has been developing very exciting lithium metal batteries for uh, high energy density uh, applications such as uh, aviation need. Uh, with that, Richard, I'll let you, uh, oh, take it from here, but let me mention one thing. Richard was the uh, Forbes 30 under 30 winner several years ago. Uh, that's a very well-deserving honor, Richard. 
Uh, take you from here, Richard. Okay, thank you, Eve, for the kind welcome and for everyone here uh, for inviting us to, to this uh, very exciting event. Uh, so I shared my screen, now I'll get started here. Uh, so my name is Richard Wang. I'm the co-founder and CEO at Kuberg. Uh, as E mentioned, we spun out of Stanford in 2016 and developing lithium metal batteries for uh, electric aviation. So just uh, some, uh, the, the talk uh, that I'm gonna give today will be focused a little bit about introduction to what Kuberg does uh, in terms of our technology and product, and then really focused on our perspective on what it takes to develop batteries for electric aviation and some of the learnings that we've come across in our experience working with our customers uh, to really push forward uh, on this field. Um, so uh, uh, about Kuberg, uh, as I mentioned, we're currently still based in the Bay Area. Uh, we haven't moved very far. We're in the East Bay, currently in San Leandro in a new headquarters that we just uh, moved into. Uh, working on a lithium metals technology, which I'll describe in greater detail later, we see uh, advanced air mobility as really being the key driver of battery innovation, but ultimately also as a stepping stone towards much larger volume markets in the future, uh, such as automotive and elsewhere. Uh, as you e mentioned, we uh, were acquired by Norfolk uh, back in March 2021, 20, and we're incredibly excited about what this partnership means for the industry, and in particular, I think what we can really do together with Norfolk to make a true impact and deliver a valuable product for the air mobility uh, industry. And so very quickly uh, about Norfolk, uh, it is a Swedish startup founded in 2016 by a couple of ex-Tesla uh, supply chain executives, Peter Carlson and Paolo uh, Ciruti. Uh, they are currently now 2,500 people uh, based in uh, Stockholm, as well as in, uh, building gigafactories in uh, far northern Sweden, as well as uh, Germany now looking at uh, additional expansion plans beyond Europe as well. Uh, principally focused on automotive uh, 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 markets uh, with uh, large customers like VW, BMW, Volvo, and so forth, but also have products in the grid and industrial sectors. Uh, I think at this point, $50 billion in revenue has been contracted already. Uh, there's much, much demand for lithium ion batteries these days and have raised $4 billion in funding, equ equity funding so far. And, and one really notable thing, which I'll uh, keep uh, coming back to later, is that Norfolk uh, is, I think, one of the first cell manufacturers to really become uh, fully vertically integrated from upstream raw materials uh, uh, through to making their own active materials, through to making their own prismatic and cylindrical cells, and then also doing uh, module and system design, uh, as well as uh, end of life cell recycling all under uh, one roof. Uh, and I, I believe this will come to really to become a model for the battery industry, but, but even more so uh, for the air mobility sector. And so with Norfolk, uh, we have a, a, a pretty uh, unique uh, responsibility here. I, 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 uh, three, three main areas. One is uh, to serve as Norfolk's Advanced Technology Center in Silicon Valley. Uh, this is really a technology scouting and open innovation role to work with the, the leading innovators from uh, universities like, like Will and E, as well as the, uh, the exciting startups in the area to really figure out how do we uh, think about corporate partnerships in the most effective and savvy manner, uh, working with these companies to advance the state of technology. We are, of course, focused on pushing forward our current, uh, our next gen battery technology focused on liquid electrolyte with lithium metal cells and really building out the aviation business unit on behalf of uh, Norfolk uh, as the first market for uh, lithium metal cells. So just a little bit, uh, since this is a battery talk about uh, what we do here at Kuberg, and honestly, I do see this type of approach as being the most likely type of cell architecture uh, to get commercialized for, for uh, uh, air mobility. Uh, essentially, we have replaced the graphite anode in the lithium ion cell with a much, much lighter weight uh, lithium metal anode. Uh, the lithium is ultimately the lightest anode material that you can use on the per uh, periodic table provides exceptional specific energy and power, which is exactly what you'd need for air mobility. Uh, to make lithium metal work, because it's a very, uh, let's say, sensitive and, and reactive material, we have developed a new non-flammable liquid electrolyte to stabilize this anode and enable uh, good, good cyclability and reliability. Uh, this is in contrast to uh, a lot of companies these days that are developing solid state electrolytes. Uh, where instead of using a liquid, they've uh, really changed the, completely the architecture of the cell to use a solid membrane as the separator and the electrolyte for ion transport. Um, uh, while it has, you know, I think, some, some interesting benefits, uh, one of the main challenges here with sol a solid state approach is that it's not really uh, easily compatible with the existing 
lithium ion manufacturing uh, processes. And so really the benefit of using this liquid electrolyte system is that you can integrate it into existing uh, factories and, and scale it up much faster and more reliably compared to uh, other technologies out there. Uh, and in particular, this really is our vision with Norfolk, like to really fully leverage our partnership with Norfolk and leverage their manufacturing capabilities. Uh, the more that we make this compatible with the processes they're already running in their gigafactory today, the faster we can really scale volumes uh, and economies of scale to drive uh, and deliver a, a compelling product here. Other than the electrolyte and the lithium metal, the rest of our cell is actually quite standard. We use a standard uh, polyolefin uh, separator, lithium ion separator, as well as a standard uh, nickel rich uh, NMC cathode material, essentially the same cathode material that Norfolk already uses today in their automotive products. And so you can see it really does leverage to a su substantial extent the supply chain and the maturity of a company like Norfolk, but really you know, focused on making innovations where it really matters on the lithium metal and, and on the uh, liquid electrolyte. And so the two segments where we really see lithium metal cells taking off are in advanced air mobility, which is the focus of this talk, and then a high performance automotive applications, which, are, which I'll briefly touch, touch on. Uh, advanced air mobility, uh, there's quite a few different applications, which I'll talk about uh, a little more later. Um, but this includes both ferrying people as well as cargo around in various different uh, ranges and configurations. It's very, very sensitive to specific energy and also to specific power given uh, takeoff requirements, especially for vertical takeoff. But it's not so sensitive to fast charge performance. On the other hand, uh, I, I think uh, Lithium metal will also enter the automotive sector, but you're not going to see it initially in, let's say, your 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 mass market sort of uh, you know Model Three or ID Four kind kind of vehicle. It's going to start out most likely uh, with sports cars, premium SUVs, and then really I think long haul heavy duty trucking being one of the primary uh, automotive users. These are segments, the trucking in particular, that are quite difficult to electrify uh, because of weight limitations on trucks. And so the weight savings of lithium metal cells will actually be quite important in enabling that whole segment. And this is an area that we see coming online a little bit later than air mobility uh, because of the cost sensitivity uh, as well as sensitivity to, to fast charge. But at the end of the day, uh, a very achievable target as well for, for lithium metal. And so the two companies uh, here with me today are Beta Technologies and Eviation. Um, and so I'll let them uh, talk about their projects uh, uh, as they come up. But uh, as illustrative examples of what this market looks like, uh, broadly defined, you have two classes of aircraft. One is eVTOL, which is electric vertical takeoff and landing. So you take off vertically and then transition to horizontal flight for cruise efficiency and then land vertically as well. And this gives you significant advantages in terms of uh, where you can take off and land and the flexibility of your uh, operations. And these are used, uh, envisioned to be used for uh, air taxi and regional air mobility applications to ferry passengers around uh, very cost effectively, as well as uh, cargo and transport applications. Uh, Aviation is working on what's called an EC tall aircraft. So this is conventional uh, takeoff and landing. And this is something that essentially looks like a uh, existing uh, plane. Uh, but uh, with uh, really optimized for batteries and electric propulsion and for cruise efficiency, but essentially it'll use a regular airfield, take off horizontally, fly horizontally, and land horizontally as well. Um, so uh, the, this, this, air, this kind of aircraft in many ways is somewhat easier to certify because it is as, so more similar to existing aircraft that are already in operation today. And, and particularly will be, I think, uh, quite impactful in the regional air mobility market to take passengers around at, at very low cost. And so our vision for why uh, I think air mobility is such a unique driver of uh, battery innovation, uh, you know, the more I see in this industry, the, the more I, I'm convinced of this uh, hypothesis. Uh, and and I'll, I'll talk more in detail later on some of the numbers about exactly why it is. But at a high level, uh, you can really just think about it as flying objects are extremely sensitive to weight. And any kind of weight that you can shave off of a vehicle is, is profoundly important in terms of the types of aircraft you can design, the passengers and cargo you can carry, and really even the, the business models that you can enable with uh, air, air mobility. And so there's such a strong drive for lighter weight batteries um, that uh, it, it really, you have this very strong push and very strong partnership with the customers to push forward on battery innovation. Uh, the companies in the sector also happen to be very technically savvy and nimble with beta and aviation as, as two great examples. Uh, um, and so really they are pushing the envelope uh, both on aircraft design as well as 
on uh, next gen battery technology. They're not afraid to make a bet on, on better technology if they really see the value and the reliability there. It's also a, a super rapidly growing and high margin business. And so because it's much less competitive and commoditized compared to other battery markets for, for very good reasons, but because it is less commoditized, uh, this is a, a more sensible first uh, uh, entry point for new technologies that typically will take some number of years to scale up in maturity and volumes to drive economies of scale. Uh, it's not a great model to immediately try to jump towards a mass market automotive application because you're gonna lose a whole lot of money trying to pursue this kind of uh, cost sensitive uh, industry. Um, and so air mobility, I think for all these reasons is, is, is a, a super strong driver for, for battery innovation these days. Uh, I do see air mobility as being a stepping stone towards driving automotive um, integration of lithium metal cells as well in, in a fairly quick way, but I would say it's maybe two or three years later in commercial adoption compared to air mobility. Uh, automotive customers are really um, uh, slower adopters and not, not, not intrinsically because the companies are slow, although maybe some of them are as well, but, but because the value proposition for energy density is not nearly as high. I would argue it's actually one to two orders of magnitude lower in terms of the value proposition they derive from energy density uh, compared to what air mobility derives from energy density. Um, and, and by having an early market, we're able to really demonstrate um, the capabilities that we have, this then allows us to accelerate and de-risk the adoption of this into the automotive market uh, without really needing to sort of subsidize uh, the developments and subsidize the scale up until it gets to a point where it actually can stand on its own, own two feet in, in automotive. And so um, I, I'm gonna start, I think, diving now into some of the, the unique um, uh, dynamics uh, that I see for the industry. Uh, but one, one final point here is that uh, we, we are really in very, very close partnership with, with Norfolk. And I think as you'll see in the following pages, uh, this kind of an integration is absolutely critical in terms of success in the uh, advanced battery sector and particularly for air mobility. And so with, with Norfolk, we're actively working with quite a few teams across the board, certainly in terms of materials like cathode and separator. Um, but, but I think even more critically in terms of uh, module developments and systems integration work uh, to really understand how do our cells um, get into a system and ultimately into a certified aircraft, uh, as well as beginning a collaboration on their recycling capabilities. Um, uh, ultimately, when we can offer this really true portfolio of offerings to air mobility customers is really when you'll see uh, this industry uh, take off and have batteries that really can, can go all the way in terms of serving the needs uh, of this market. So uh, first, looking at uh, cell level requirements for air mobility, um, you know, I, I would argue based on you know, what I've heard in the industry that most customers are pretty happy if you can get to roughly 400 watt hours per kilogram at the cell level. Of course, everyone would always want more specific energy. You can never have enough. <laughs> uh, but, but what we see is if we get to about 400 at the cell level, 300 at the module level, you're at a point where a lot of the early business models and applications are enabled and, and can be done with aircraft designs that are currently already in uh, test flights today. This represents roughly a 50% increase uh, from uh, the best kind of lithium ion modules these days, which are at about 200 watt hours per kilogram for uh, aviation grade modules. Um, so, so literally a 50% increase in uh, how much you can fly. Uh, EC tall uh, conventional takeoff has, I would say, moderate power requirements, nothing crazy maybe something up to like one and a half C or two C for, for a few minutes at, at takeoff. And then you're really kind of cruising and using the lift of your wings for a very, very efficient cruise. So maybe 0.5 C or, or even a little lower 0.3 C for cruise. Uh, EVTOL, because of the vertical takeoff nature, um, has much higher power requirements. I would say EVTOL is a much more diverse set of uh, aircraft designs. So there isn't kind of a one size fits all set of numbers for what EVTOL requires. Um, but uh, roughly speaking, probably on the order of four or five C for 60 to 90 seconds for, for takeoff. And then uh, 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 sometimes you actually need to pulse up to eight C for one to two minutes for emergency landings, which I'll talk a little bit more later about why that's needed. But really that this is part of um, really having a redundancy uh, in uh, aircraft, even if you have a, one entire uh, module or pack uh, go out of service, you still need to do emergency landing. Um, so very, very rigorous power requirements. And then cruise is, is much more efficient, maybe 1C, uh, 1.5C, depending on the efficiency of the uh, aircraft. Uh, but you can see 
um, these, these numbers, I mean, these C rates are high, but what makes it even more difficult is these are C rates assuming a 400 watt hour per kilogram cell level. So when you multiply the C rate by the you know, greatly higher specific energy at the cell level, you're really talking about very, very high levels of specific power, watts per kilogram. And only if you look at the lithium ion industry, only the very, very highest power kind of pouch cells can actually hit these kinds of specific power requirements. But the cells that are designed for such high power with lithium ion end up having specific energy of you know, 200 watt hours per kilogram or, or, or lower, uh, um, even at the cell level, like 200, 220 watt hours per kilo for high power cells. So, so using the lithium metal chemistry uh, allows you to use a high power design uh, high power cell design while still achieving really high specific energy. And it's really that combination of high energy and power uh, th that delivers what you need for uh, air mobility. In terms of uh, use cases, uh, fast charge is not nearly as critical as uh, automotive where everyone is saying they want to get to 3C, 4C and beyond fast charge. Uh, with uh, air mobility, uh, typically what we find is when you get to sort of the 1C, maybe 1.5C uh, charge rate, uh, this is enough for most of the early business models. Maybe not when you're kind of super optimized and, and flying around in cities, but, but right now this is uh, likely sufficient uh, given you do need to turn the aircraft around, load and unload your passengers and cargo and clean the aircraft uh, and, and so forth. And, and the other piece of this is uh, you're not actually sitting on the ground for a full hour uh, you know, charging at one seat because the typical depth of discharge is maybe 50% or, or even less for most uh, aircraft designs. And the reason for this is really from a certification requirement basis. Um, you have essentially flight reserve requirements where uh, from, from FAA and EASA saying you need, uh, for example, 20 minutes of, of flying time so that you can fly to the nearest kind of emergency landing site or airfield. And so that kind of requirement, when you look at the percentage of flight time that that takes, it ends up being uh, you need to really reserve a good amount of reserves, both for uh, flight reserves as well as a buffer for you know SOC and other kinds of uh, design redundancy. So D DOD is pretty low. So even a 1C charge at 50% means you're on the ground for half an hour max. Uh, so that, that's why fast charge is not so critical uh, for, for this industry. Uh, you know, cycle life as well, you know, everyone wants more cycles. <laughs> but uh, I would say when you get to about the thousand full depth of discharge normalized uh, cycles, is sufficient for, for many of the early applications. This is going to be kind of a, a both cycle life and cost parameter. Uh, but cycle life is important, you know, even setting aside uh, unit economics because the packs are utilized um, to such a high level, high degree. You're basically trying to fly these aircraft continuously as much as possible and with very demanding profiles. So estimates are every six to 12 months, uh, these packs will need to be swapped out from the aircraft for, for new, new packs. Uh, and this actually has quite a few implications both in terms of module and system design, as well as in what kinds of capabilities and business models from a battery provider uh, really make sense to, to serve uh, these, these uh, use cases. In terms of, um, let's see, cell design and form factor, uh, we have done a lot of uh, thinking and also a lot of discussions with many different customers around the world on what really is needed for uh, an optimal, let's say, product for air mobility. And then I've at least settled my conclusion is that a pouch cell is the best type of cell for air mobility and with a capacity of maybe 15 to 25, maybe 30 amp hours being like an ideal size. Uh, the reason for this is that you basically, you want large cells because larger cells allow for better packing efficiency. This is why, you know, in automotive, automotive systems, uh, you know, Tesla aside, you know, most companies are looking at 70 plus amp hour pouch cells even 100, 120 amp hour prismatic cells. And the reason for that is they're trying to reduce the pack overhead and the packaging uh, overhead associated with their system. On the other hand though, the air mobility has much more stringent uh, safety requirements compared to automotive, uh, specifically in terms of cell thermal propagation. And, and so because you really need to be intrinsically propagation resistant uh, from a, a module and pack uh, perspective, uh, this means that really, really enormous cells are not a, a great bet uh, because it becomes very, very hard to contain that uh, thermal runaway. Uh, so that, that's why we, we believe ultimately kind of this 20 amp hour zone to be a sweet spot, balancing packing efficiency with thermal propagation considerations. You can also ask why not cylindrical, why not prismatic? Uh, cylindrical cells lack the power capability. Typically, you know, you can also get high power cylindrical cells, yes, uh, but, but you know, 
sort of um, order of magnitude, you have this very, very long foil. It's a wound electrode with a long conduction pathways and high electrical resistance. Um, with something like the for Tesla 4680 concept that's tabless, that uh, uh, takes care of a lot of this. So you could, in, in theory, get very high power out of that kind of cell if designed for high power applications. But the other challenge of cylindrical cells is they don't accommodate next-gen chemistries very well. Uh, because of the wound nature, it doesn't tend to do very well with very high silicon content or lithium metal anodes because of the swelling and pressure requirements uh, that are more unique to next-gen chemistries. And then finally, Prismatic cells, I, I think, are, will just be too heavy. Prismatic cells work well when you're at this kind of 70, 100 amp hour plus size, but the but the packaging is pretty heavy. And when you try to scale it down to a cell that's 20 amp hours, you just have too much uh, packaging uh, overhead and weight overhead. So this is like why I think nobody has really seriously considered prismatic cells uh, in terms of um, air mobility uh, aircraft. And then specific energy, I think, is absolutely critical. And I, I, I think some back of the envelope math here is actually very illustrative. Um, an EV tall, let's say it costs $15 per miles, not including the batteries uh, to operate. This includes pilot, maintenance, kind of everything else embedded in that cost. This is kind of a middle of the road figure from you know, a few studies I've looked at. If you look at basically kind of battery cost and size, typically 250 kilowatt hour pack multiplied by some dollars per kilowatt hour, and your plane is carrying some number of passengers, let's say it's 200 miles, if you went zero to 100% SOC, 1,000 cycles, like reasonable assumptions on uh, what this would look like. If you look at a lithium ion scenario, um, you, you plug in some numbers, you know, 200 watt hours per kilo at the, at the pack level, you, you get to basically a pack that's, uh, let's say 1250 kilograms. Uh, conservatively, even if we say it's a super cheap automotive kind of cost pack, $100 per kilowatt hour, uh, if it carries three passengers, the battery is going to be a minute fraction in terms of passenger miles, four cents per passenger mile, but the total cost of operation is five dollars, four cents per passenger mile, because you're dividing that $15 by three people. And, and really where specific energy comes in is when you can have a lighter pack, 300 uh, watt hours per kilo, you're saving uh, you know, more than 400 kilograms here in terms of battery weight. And so even if you assume it's $1,000 a kilowatt hour, you know, 10 times more expensive, um, uh, the, the, the key thing is if you're saving 400 kilograms, you can probably carry you know, one or two extra passengers plus cargo plus over aircraft overhead. And then even at $1,000 per kilowatt hour, battery cost is not crazy, 25 cents per passenger mile, but your total cost of operation goes down to $3.25 per passenger mile. So, so the key takeaway is, uh, is that it's much more important to increase, increase specific energy because this allows you to carry more cargo and more passengers to defray your overall operating costs because batteries are not the, the, the biggest or nearly the biggest cost driver um, in, in uh, the air, sort of uh, uh, build, build materials and, and uh, driving uh, economics for air mobility. So you could actually say, you know, <laughs> if you run the numbers like you know, side by side, like increasing specific energy is worth something like $8,000 per kilowatt hour. Like this is, you know, Maybe it's 5,000, maybe it's 10,000. But, but the key thing is, this is why specific energy is absolutely so critical for air mobility. The other two, I think, uh, unique considerations here are that um, aircraft certification is one of the most difficult things uh, in this industry and represents a key risk to timelines. I think nobody doubts this industry will become enormous eventually, but we don't exactly know when yet. And, and so supply chains and production from a battery manufacturer perspective, it's very different from a standard uh, supply chain consideration for automotive cells. You need some very much stricter process controls for all production processes, traceability to your key materials, and production lines that are purpose designed for aerospace quality and traceability standards. Um, you need to design your modules to be uh, DO 311A compliant. This is the current safety standard for uh, uh, flight batteries, um, but but designed for things like you know the battery on the 787, not for propulsion batteries. But this is the best we have so far on what regulators might consider for battery safety. And essentially, you need a pack to withstand single or multi-cell thermal runaway while preventing full propagation and still being able to do emergency landing. Um, but the details of this certification pathway at the module level really have not been uh, fully determined. And that's one of the big, I think, um, unknowns in terms of uh, what it takes to actually get batteries into these systems. Um, and then in terms of geographies and aircraft types, this is getting beyond really my core area of expertise. But broadly speaking, uh, uh, there, there's kind of different certification levels depending on 
uh, what type of aircraft you're building. And so most companies are looking at part 23, which is small aircraft, smaller than 19,000 pounds um, or 19 passengers. Um, and, or part 27, like a helicopter for eVTOL. And these have an ac accident rate that's acceptable by FAA of 100 parts per billion. Um, EASA is considering regulating eVTOL sort of more similarly to a commercial airliner level of reliability, one part per billion accident rate. And, and this actually can have a substantial impact in terms of timelines and costs to actually get to market. Um, and so nothing has been finalized, which is you know, the uncertainty is challenging to design around, but, but really, uh, different geographies are considering doing this in different ways, which will impact where you see early uptake in terms of uh, air mobility adoption. And then finally, I think uh, uh, vertical integration is absolutely critical to success. Um, uh, one of the things that I've really come to realize is that a standardized pouch cell format is, 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 has huge benefits. The reason for this is that it's very expensive and slow to certify an air mobility cell and module uh, because of all the, the requirements I, I've just mentioned. And volumes per aircraft are also much, much lower compared to any kind of automotive volumes for the foreseeable future. People are not buying tens of gigawatts of, of cells anytime this, this decade from a single customer. Um, and on the other hand, structural integration, I would say, is, is less critical compared to automotive because you cannot literally just embed it into your, your aircraft. There has to essentially be some sort of maintenance bay that you can open and swap out aircraft and basically blocks of batteries that come in and out. And, and given this, um, it's not so critical to like have this like perfectly like designed flat pack battery, for example. You have sort of more flexibility to, to accommodate different kinds of cell geometries. Um, and so cell standardization ultimately is actually a viable solution in this industry that ultimately will give us much better cost control and economies of scale compared to having custom cells for every single uh, aircraft. This directly feeds into systems integration. My, my view is aircraft developers shouldn't need to design their own custom module. Um, that they, they should uh, standardize if possible. And, and next-gen chemistries present pretty unique challenges for module design. Uh, so this is, I think, one reason why cell developers should take it upon themselves to design their modules as well, because you really need to know the cell well to design the module. Um, and certification costs, again, costs and timelines can be defrayed if you can use one common module for all, all aircraft. And then finally, integrated data systems are also needed to ensure reliability and optimization of battery use to maximize uh, cycle life. So you need a whole lot of systems engineering and beyond just having a good cell to really succeed um, in this market. And then finally, I would say you really need the full scope from upstream to downstream in terms of raw materials, supply chain traceability and control, um, as well as looking at second life opportunities. Uh, these battery modules will be highly advanced and highly engineered. And uh, we're not just gonna throw them away, of course, after they're done on the aircraft. And there are other great applications in which we can use Second Life, and then ultimately needing to take care of recycling. So there's a whole lot of things that we need to figure out in this supply chain to make this battery industry uh, work well uh, for our customers. And ultimately, I would argue the most reasonable and elegant uh, solution to do this is to have really a, a supplier take care of all these different responsibilities, be an end-to-end -end, um supplier uh, of energy for aircraft at the end of the day and take care of uh, all the kind of considerations from beginning to end of life in terms of managing uh, these technologies. I think this ultimately will be the most reliable way for, uh, for companies to deliver high quality batteries, uh, but it also does mean that it, this is a very difficult uh, market to enter, uh, to be honest. Um, without this kind of vertical integration, even if you have a great sell, it's going to be pretty tough to actually get into this market. Um, so this is kind of the, I think, both the beauty and, and the curse of air mobility is it's an incredible value proposition, incredible industry uh, with clearly a very high um, uh, drive for innovation in batteries, but it's also not easy for a battery supplier to actually make it into the market here. Um, and so you need to really focus on building this sort of holistic uh, infrastructure and, and ecosystem to really deliver uh, good products for, for air mobility. Um, and so my, my kind of, I think, sort of, Conclusion and takeaway message is my, I feel that the battery really is the jet engine of the advanced air mobility era. Um, just as jet engines have been absolutely critical to defining aircraft designs and even business models um, and, and economics and fuel efficiency, of course, it is even more the case that batteries are the defining technology for really enabling different kinds of business models and aircraft designs in the advanced air mobility era. Um, and so I think just as jet engine manufacturers have such a close partnership with the key uh, aircraft designers, uh, it is our intent with New Northfold and Cuba to really uh, be that have that same kind of capability 
that we can deliver from a battery perspective for the air mobility era. Um, so that that's all I have to say. Uh, happy to uh, answer questions here. Well, thank you so much, Richard. This is very exciting. Uh, maybe we will take uh, a few questions only for now, because uh, we are going to have a panel discussion later. Um, so Richard, the first question um, is, uh, one of the person is asking, um, compared to lithium metal technology, uh, what are the competing technology out there? Uh, for example, people talk about hydrogen fuel cells, right? There's, uh, uh, also others like the silicon anode I'm very familiar with from Ampere's, uh, uh, you know, for the uh, high energy density battery, it would be good to see your, your thought on, on this, yeah. Yeah, so I think first in the battery realm, other than, let's see, lithium metal, um, as a, how, how I've described it with liquid electrolytes, you have solid state batteries, but I think solid state has challenges for a number of reasons. Solid electrolytes are dense and heavy, so it's hard to get a specific energy and power that you get from a liquid electrolyte system. Uh, I think silicon is, is a possibility if you can really figure out very high utilization uh, silicon anodes, which is by, by no means easy as well. But if you could figure out a really high utilization and high loading silicon, you could get to very high energy densities. So I think that's a possibility. You have uh, lithium sulfur, but sulfur has many well-known challenges. We don't have many prominent sulfur plays these days with Oxus uh, going out of business a year or two ago. Um, so I think sulfur is a little far off and the volumetric energy is very, very low, which makes it tough to integrate into an aircraft. And then finally, if you look at outside of battery technologies, I don't really see hydrogen or let's say synthetic fuels as being a direct competition to batteries. And the reason is that any kind of aircraft that you could fly with batteries is gonna be vastly more attractive to do with batteries than with hydrogen, uh, because it's so much more efficient, both in terms of the systems you have to design as well as the fuel costs to use electricity and to use batteries. So where we see hydrogen and synthetic fuels coming in is not in these kinds of EV tall, EC tall, short haul uh, aircraft, but really when you start looking at very large planes, 50, 100 seater and beyond, and trying to fly kind of 1,000 miles and beyond in range, that's where batteries really tap out and you look at those alternatives. Yeah. Um, maybe one more question uh, here, Richard, for you. Uh, for Kilberg, uh, the lithium metal batteries, um, what's the uh, current status right now? Uh, the specific energy cycle life and so on, right? So. Uh, uh, people are wondering, you know, how, how sure. far you are, yeah. Sure, sure. We've been keeping a little quiet recently because we, we like to, you know, when we go out with needs, we like to do it with third party independently validated results. So I don't like to make too many claims until I'm able to, to prove it as well. <laughs> uh, it's always a, a challenge in the industry. But, uh, you know, to give a, a rough notion, uh, currently we're developing a couple different formats of cells. We have a five amp hour technology demonstrator where we integrate and demonstrate uh, new approaches and, and materials. And then we have a couple of different uh, commercial designs in the 15 to 25 amp hour range that we're actively testing uh, with customers. This is more designed for uh, actual uh, module integration uh, purposes. Um, and specific energy wise, roughly 370 to 400 waters per kilogram, depending on the variant, getting pretty close to 400 with our, our newer gen stuff. Um, and uh, you know, very high power, as I mentioned, uh, very, very high uh, power rates. And then cycle life getting beyond five to 600 full depth of discharge cycles at this point. Um, but you know, I, again, I don't wanna make too many claims for now. That's why we haven't been gone public with this stuff. We'll, we'll hopefully release third-party results in the coming uh, one or two quarters. This is very nice, Richard, thank you. Uh, I will discuss more in the uh, panel discussion. Well, back to you. Let me add my thanks to Rich as well for that wonderful introduction and connecting um, the requirements at the level of deploying to the battery material requirement. Uh, I think this will be a very important theme for the seminar today. So it's my great pleasure then to welcome our next speaker. Herman, are you on the line here? Excellent. Well, Herman is uh, joining us from the UK. Uh, so again, we have a very international audience and international presenters today. So thank you very much, Herman, for taking your Friday evening uh, to join us. Um, so Herman uh, is a very richly decorated um, battery veteran. Uh, he spent, uh, if I remember correctly, about 18 years at GE Global Research in New York, where he led a variety of projects for energy storage, um, was an early innovator for sodium ion, a sodium 
uh, sulfur-based battery technology and other sodium ion-based battery technology. And he touched upon a wide variety of applications uh, from grit level um, to backup for telecom systems and many other things as well. Um, so uh, Herman saw these energy transition coming long ago. And uh, now he is leading the electric propulsion team at Beta Technologies. And Herman, we're super excited to hear from you, both from a battery side and from a plane side, how these two are coming together. Herman, the floor is yours. Thank you, Will. Thank you so much. And also, Richard, for your excellent overview of the market and the energy storage needs. I'm going to share um, a little bit more on the aircraft side. Uh, talk a little bit about electric vertical takeoff and landing development, but also some of the energy storage testing challenges and uh, making the storage system safe enough for flight or for aviation use. We're really looking for a sustainability um, goal to make electrified flights such that it's more sustainable from a carbon footprint point of view. We're also going after that vertical takeoff and landing aspect. Uh, to get more use from the aircraft instead of just limited to uh, airfield use. So vertical takeoff and landing, some people call it EVA, electric vertical aircraft, um, but it's really a, a new area and it's really initiated by the onset of distributed propulsion systems and the new advanced battery technologies such that Richard talked about. And so things are becoming more realistic. Uh, we're able to achieve flight of reasonable distance. So the minimal viable product has been achieved. And we see obviously many players in the field entering the EV tall space. I think it's on the order of 400 companies have ideas and about 15 or so are making serious effort and uh, progress. All right, who's beta technologies? Um, we also don't like to over promote ourselves. We only like to release news when we're ready. Um, <laughs> that may not be the best approach in this hyper connected world of ours, but we are located in Vermont. And this is a picture of our LEA aircraft and CTOL configuration uh, flying over Plattsburgh, uh, New York. Our focus is really to make elegant electric aviation solutions for our customers. And they are obviously concerned with cost effectiveness, safety, and also environmental impact. And our first customer is actually from the medical field where United Therapeutics was focused on producing replaceable organs and uh, organ transplants. And they often found that they were transporting their organs from the uh, creation site or resuscitation site to the patient through a lot of um, te conventional technologies like helicopters and airplanes and trucks and ambulances. And they thought, gosh, you know, it's great if we can save the patient, but wouldn't it be even better in the process if we could also save the planet? Because if you save the patient, but not the planet, then it's kind of doesn't, didn't go well with them. So they really were an early adopter of EV tall technology and really encouraged us um, through their use case. This is a picture of the team from about a year ago. Um, and our headquarters at Burlington International Airport. Uh, we do have uh, aircrafts in the background is the ALEA aircraft uh, in black carbon fiber. And you see some conventional aircraft as well, because that's also part of our culture. Um, we're about the same age as Kuberg and oddly Northvolt around this 2016, early 2017 is when we formed the company and uh, started uh, uh, developing electrified aircraft solutions. We are uh, pragmatic, uh, focused on the core technologies and providing a total solution to our customers because it's not just the aircraft. Uh, there's many other aspects. We try to focus on those uh, parts of the system puzzle as well. And flying is part of our culture. We encourage all of our employees to take lessons. And here we're just doing a, a formation flight. And it's, it's, it's great fun to, to hear all the employees talk about the aspects of the aircraft that they like, which one that, you know, they, they, are they flying a conventional, you know, Cessna or a tail dragger or a, a higher performance aircraft or a stunt aircraft. And some people say, isn't that a waste? Why, why are you doing that? Why are you teaching your employees to fly? Well, would you buy a car from a set of engineers that didn't have driver's licenses. And you have to think about that. 
And so everyone in the country, the company is very much uh, part of the aviation culture and is passionate about it. And that really helps uh, when it comes to uh, higher performing and safer aircraft. At Beta, we do focus a lot on first principles uh, from an aircraft point of view, and we have to make sure we do well in each of these four areas uh, in order to make a truly um, honest and, and good performing aircraft. Uh, the empty weight really talks about the structure of the aircraft and the systems. That could be everything from the flight controls to the landing gear to the pilot seat, uh, but really it's dominated by the, the, the structure of the aircraft, the skin, uh, the ribs, the spars. And uh, we spent a lot of time making the empty weight as low as possible. The second really that we, thing that we focus on is the energy storage. Uh, it's a significant portion of the weight of the aircraft, roughly in the order of 30 to 40% of the weight of the aircraft is, is in batteries. Um, so we really have to get the most from those. And Richard did a great job talking about the specific energy density, getting that north of 400 watt hours per kilogram at the cell level such that when it's packaged, maybe it might be then eroded to about 300 watt hours per kilogram. Those are good numbers to shoot for, for a minimally viable product. Uh, also, we can talk quickly about the power capability. Richard also mentioned the watts per kilogram are important as well, particularly at low, higher depths of discharge, lower states of charge, in order to achieve those uh, landings, particularly in vertical uh, flight. Efficiency is the third topic we would focus a lot on, and that comes down to the power conversion efficiencies. And for electric drive systems, it's usually up in the 90 you know, or so percent range, and so we have to pay attention there. The last aspect is what's called L over D. Uh, that's lift over drag. So how good is the aircraft at producing lift? How efficient are the wings? And what's the drag of the aircraft? How elegant is it? And so we really have to pay attention to that. And uh, and simplicity um, is really a driver for us. Uh, simplicity helps in terms of safety, in terms of failure modes, in terms of certification. I'm just going to do a quick synthesis um, of a, our aircraft that we call the ALEA platform. We start with the cargo, the pilot, and putting that into a teardrop shape body or fuselage. It has to be voluminous enough. We were given a challenge of a certain pallet system, a certain you know four foot by four foot cube, and two operators, a pilot and or a crew. And so that's who you, that's how we started this concept. Then you have to make it fly. To do that, obviously adding the wings and tail, and we added the efficient pusher uh, propeller in the back. It uh, helps with the uh, ingestion of air across the fuselage. It's the most efficient place to put a propeller on a simple aircraft like this. Well, that's great for cruise flight, but we also wanted to have the vertical flight component. What does that look like? Well, if you add a quadcopter to that original fuselage, this is what a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft could look like. Um, we did go for a quad in this particular application. Um, and we wanted to have something that could have streamline propeller blades during cruise flight. Uh, so when the lift system is not in use, we could just park them and have efficient uh, forward flight. Putting those two concepts together uh, ends up with the ALEA aircraft. We're hoping to achieve 250 nautical miles of ultimate range, around 105 knots. These are not very fast aircraft and um, hopefully less than one hour recharge. And that's the synthesis of a first generation electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. Uh, this is a actual view of serial number two aircraft that we have. And there's two variants, a cargo variant and a passenger variant that we're going to be developing. Um, there are some other restrictions that were applied uh, vertical takeoff and landing aircraft can land on helicopter pads, and those are often restricted to 50 foot squares. And so the wingspan of the aircraft is somewhat restricted to the same 50 feet. Another goal is to keep it below 7,000 pounds, and this gets back into the certification requirements. Aircraft below 7,000 pounds have a slightly different set of rules than those above. And so those are sure the two constraints that will be driving the designs of many of these EV tall aircraft. 
But we talked about systems. It's not just the aircraft. You have to have a means of recharging it. And so we've been developing elevated uh, recharge pad solutions, uh, leveraging technologies such as the automotive recharge equipment. And we've also been uh, operating and um, uh, testing these various systems on our aircraft uh, in winter in Vermont, where there's icing and snowing, right? So we're just learning so much and we're making uh, tweaks and changes to these systems to go from, let's say, electric vehicle use to now aviation use. And so it's been a wonderful uh, progression of learnings as we develop these recharging infrastructure. Uh, the other thing we're doing is really investing in the network. Um, because if you have one charger, that's great. You can take off and land from one airport. If you have many chargers, now you can actually fly somewhere. Um, so what we have right now is about nine sites uh, installed and about 51 sites in progress, either uh, uh, engineering plans made or uh, ground has been broken. So we're, we're progressing on this. All right, once you have an aircraft and you can recharge it and fly it, well, it takes a pilot and that takes certain training. Uh, we've been spending a lot of time uh, doing flight training for this particular class of aircraft because it's not well documented uh, in terms of pilotage requirements today with the FAA. They have things like helicopter pilots, they have multi-engine pilots, but they don't have electrified EV tall pilots. And so we have to come up with the curriculum and the testing standards and requirements in order to certify those air uh, pilots to to fly this class of aircraft. And so we've been doing a lot of work in that area. And there we go. Uh, this is serial number one, Alia aircraft. Um, we're hoping to go through the FAA certification process. Uh, we have engaged and we've initiated that process, uh, but it does take time uh, to get from uh, the proposal all the way through certification testing. We're not going to commit to that time frame. It's going to take as much time as necessary to assure that the aircraft is safe for use. But because our aircraft does not have any articulating rotors or pitching propellers or tilting wings or other, I would say, complicated or complex systems, uh, we feel that this aircraft, due to its simplicity of dedicated lift and dedicated cruise systems, will have a much um, more clear pathway to, to test for, for safety and for, verifi uh, for verification and validation. The last part of my talk, I'm going to take a few minutes and talk about the challenges around energy storage testing to show that they are safe and appropriate for use on aircraft. I'll be focusing on cylindrical cells. Um, we are in development uh, with Qberg on advanced cells for our application. Uh, but the examples I've taken today will focus on cylindrical cells. In general, there's three broad classes of testing that we have to do at the aircraft level. We first have to do safety testing of the battery systems. We're also very interested in cycle testing. And then finally, we do environmental testing. This is everything from salt fog to high altitude to humidity to all these other factors, EMI. And so if we start at the left, focus truly on the cell first, and then the module, and then the battery pack. A lot of effort is spent there. That's the most important step. Because if you have the highest energy density cell, but it's very difficult to package safely, you can't successfully implement it. And so we do a lot of testing at that level to ensure that we can appropriately package the cells in a module and then at a battery pack level. The next most important thing to us is the cycle testing. How long does the battery last? How does it behave? Any, any unusual aging functions? Because fuel gauging is very important to this industry. Um, the accuracy of reporting the battery's capability such that one can reliably land the aircraft at low uh, state of charge is very important. But the challenge, of course, is that the aircraft is often flown between, let's say, 100% state of charge and 50. Not often does it go from 50% state of charge to lower. That's what we call the reserve range, or let's say. And so there has to be a very good mathematical model 
probably based upon a, a good fundamental understanding of the electrochemical reactions. It's very difficult to do all of this uh, cycle or fuel gauging with simple you know, equivalent circuit models. One really needs to go down to electrochemical uh, modeling. And finally, environmental test. Um, that's the sort of the, the refinement finally at the end, the polishing the stone. I will go over just a few of the tests that are difficult, and I'll show you examples of how we do testing around one of those. The majority of the requirements given to us uh, through the DO311 uh, requirements, so many of them are easy. Make sure the battery has the rated capacity or make sure it has grab handles so you can lift it or move it. There are some of those requirements that are well, low risk, but still need some discussion or, or how do we pass this test or what's the appropriate manner? I, I call those yellow or orange. And finally, there's the three high risk tests, uh, thermal runaway containment, 50 foot drop, and one of the tests that can be very difficult is the over discharge and recharge several times without protections, uh, because that can induce failure inside the cells. And so I'll be spending a little bit of time on, for example, the drop testing. Um, and everyone likes slow motion pictures, right? I brought and I'll give you a movie here. But um, 50 foot drop test results in the aircraft hitting the ground. And in our particular aircraft, the batteries are located underneath the floor. And it's for several different reasons. I know one of the questions online during the seminar that was given is, why don't you put them in the wings? Or is the wings the best place for the heavy batteries? That's one possible location. But depending upon the design of the aircraft, the center of gravity, center of lift, and some other factors, we decide to put the batteries under the floorboards. And so uh, we are prone then to the 50 foot drop test and the batteries are in close proximity to the uh, impact zone. And so we developed tests where we um, were able to induce failure and simulate the crash test. Can you see that running? Just give it a few seconds. This is a 21700 cylindrical cell. And it was pressed uh, into a hard barrier, and now it's ejecting from inside like a little booster rocket. And I think I stopped this video before it gets totally consumed. But it's very typical of these cells. They do not take damage in the axial direction very well. All right, let's move on. This is now uh, the next slide is a cylindrical cell, same, but now in the radial direction. And we've done a lot of testing uh, really to see how the cells behave. Uh, these happen to be uh, from a major manufacturer, uh, but this is not the sort of data that uh, is given to you from the manufacturer. So often you have to derive it yourself. Uh, but we will be working with Kuberg in an integrated effort to come up with uh, modules for aviation industry uh, based on their pouch cells. So that will be a collaborative effort. All right. We found that the radial direction, these cells were much more robust. And what that led us to, to do is orient the cells in the aircraft such that the axial direction would never point downward or forward because those are the two directions which an aircraft has to get crash tested in. And so if I move to the next slide, uh, we then developed modules with the proper cell orientation and then subjected the modules, for example, to the impact tests. And I'll just uh, let this run. It's a lot of fun for our engineers at work to develop the test fixtures. So you can see the response, for example, of this module. There is a small amount of electrical arcing initially due to the fact that the module does break some electrical connections at roughly the 50 volt potential. One cell is shown leaving this package. This still has to go through a lot of refinement and we're changing the design, but it just shows you what sort of uh, testing takes place after the cell is manufactured and brought to the integrator. I hope that gave you a good overview of electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, some of the challenges, and also a practical example of the testing that's necessary 
in order to show that the batteries are safe for use in an aircraft. All right, Herman, thank you so much for that presentation and connecting us to the cell and the module level. Very exciting uh, videos that gives another meaning to shooting batteries. Um, <laughs> So we are running a little bit late, so maybe I will just uh, put one question forward. So you talked about fast charging, and you also talk about the fact that the state of charge uh, for the battery tends to be on the high side compared to EVs. So can you speak to a little bit about the different application requirement for fast charging for um, electric planes compared to EVs? Certainly, I can go back to our the first customer that engaged us, United Therapeutics, which is a delivery of valuable medical cargo or assets or organs to, for example, hospitals and or transplant centers. When that aircraft lands at the transplant center, it is unloaded of its cargo. But it's also very important to then move that asset, that aircraft, because it has to make room for the next emergency helicopter, 911 call, whatever, to land at that air, uh, helideck. So there are requirements sometimes for fast recharge or at least partial recharge or at least just what we call a two hop mission where you, you achieve your first destination, deliver your cargo, but then you have to exit that and move on. So there are applications and situations where either the aircraft has to move to a place where it can take a little, a little longer to recharge or it has to do a fast recharge at that location. But that's not the majority. Uh, we're seeing many people can actually park their aircraft for at least an hour or two. And so fast recharge is not a universal demand, but there are applications that need it, or at least your ability to, to do a partial recharge so that you can move the aircraft uh, to a, a storage location. So to follow up on that, Herman, so from, from my sort of impression how the, the planes will be operated, sometimes if you need the fast turnaround, then the charging would uh, follow uh, discharging pretty quickly. And this is a, maybe a little bit different than some EV applications where charging are happening overnight, for example. So does the thermal management become easier with plane or harder in the sense of charging? It's more difficult in an aircraft to deal with the rapid discharge or rapid recharge of the battery. Uh, because, uh, as Richard commented, some of the C rates are up to about four or five C rate during landing. It turns out you can actually get a thermal uh, hit or accumulation of temperature during the VTOL landing component. And then you turn around and try to recharge it quickly. And that actually is the longest, uh, most challenging from a thermal standpoint, because the battery's temperature could be raised by several degrees, right? So thermal management is very important. The, trough, the difficult part is that thermal management on an aircraft is expensive because you have to carry the coolant, the pumps and everything else. And so we're doing a lot of work developing uh, thermal management from the ground-based equipment such that you fast recharge the aircraft, but you're also thermally recharging it or resetting it. And those two have to go hand in hand such that the aircraft is then prepared both thermally and electrochemically to then take off and, and have another mission. Very interesting. Thank you, Mark. Herman, thank you very much. I'll come back for more discussion at the panel session. So if I can invite Omer to come to the stage. Absolutely. Thank you, Omer. So it's a, a, a great pleasure to also welcome Omer as our third and final speaker today. Um, Omer is the founder and CEO of Eviation. And uh, he, is, uh, he, was, he is a physicist by training and uh, is also an entrepreneur by practice. Uh, so very exciting to see um, the combination of the two come together here. And uh, he has been leading e-aviation for, for six years um, to bring electric flight uh, to reality. And I just also want to add, uh, he has a, a substantial experience from the government and defense side, uh, and therefore also bring that picture uh, into consideration here. He has spent a, a number of years with the is Israeli Defense Forces. Um, after uh, finishing up uh, at the rank of a major and also uh, work in the office of the Prime Minister of Israel for a number of years. Um, he's also a great contributor to the community at large, um, participating in uh, the, e -mobili the mobility working group with NASA. So, Omar, without further ado, the floor is yours. Looking forward to your talk. Thank you, William. And Really, thanks, uh, Richard and Herman, for the great presentations. Um, I promise I'll be brief, so we'll have plenty of time. But uh, let's just dive right in. Um, this is Alice. Um, this is all Aviation Aircraft does, as uh, as was mentioned. I've been uh, 
running this company since inception, and it's actually seven years tomorrow. So you were right on the six years, but guess what? And yeah, been a while, been been there for a while. Um, I think the main difference, or the thing I kind of want you to guys to keep in mind, is that we build a very big battery. It happens to be stored in an airplane, but technically it's a battery. And one of the reasons I like the picture that you can see in front of you is you can see that parting line. It's now painted, but when this was taken, it was before we hid the sealant line. You can see the parting line between, or let's say under the windows. The entire subsection of this aircraft, and it's a 16,500 pound aircraft, is battery. Uh, we have an 8,300 pound battery. So just over 50% of the maximum takeoff weight of this machine. Um, we are based in the state of Washington, so Mount Rainier in the background and the terrible weather usually, but hey, someone got a good picture. And the story of the company is fairly simple. We started back in uh, early 2015 and built a lot of iterations. We've built different planes. This is internally, we say that this is iteration 164, 164, but obviously what's really interesting is what was built and shown so in the 2019 Paris Air Show, you can see the picture in the middle. We had a very, very different aircraft. It was a tail dragger and had uh, propellers at the wingtip. Uh, before that, we had even funnier configurations. And eventually, we zoomed into something that looks a little more traditional, can be certified a bit more easily. And the one, I would say, silver lining for all of those iterations was what I said at the beginning. It always had a huge battery, anywhere between 45 and almost 60% of maximum takeoff weight was battery. And the reason is the fundamental elephant in the room, which is batteries are actually a very, very poor way to carry energy around compared to anything else we do. And we're getting better, not quickly, but we are getting better. And what I want to talk about today is a bit about the company, a bit about the product, and then a bit more about the um, pack and the need and the issues. The aircraft is awesome. We take nine passengers and two crew, um, a total cargo um, capacity in our cargo variant of uh, 2,600 pounds, uh, 2,500 in the um, commuter variant. We fly 440 nautical miles plus 30 minutes VFR reserve. And we do it with today's terrible 21700, roughly 260 watt hour per kilogram battery cells. So please, Kuberg, fix that. The uh, cruise speed of the aircraft is 250 knots, so it's a fast machine. And you can see some of the data here on the left regarding performance. But I think the interesting part here are actually the two, the last two lines. Um, we cruise quite efficiently compared to a Beechcraft King Air, which is roughly equivalent size and, and weight at the edge of its uh, uh, weight capability, or compared to a Phenom 300 jet, which is, again, roughly the same size and, and weight, uh, we use far less energy. So Herman's uh, comment regarding uh, lift to drag ratio is definitely the driving factor here as well. There is a reason for this funky egg-shaped uh, fuselage. It's not just because we think it's nice. It's because while energy density was uh, kind of the, the connecting line for the last two presentations, energy volume does matter as well. And when we try to just take this huge battery, um, we can't put it in the wing just because there isn't enough volume there. We have to put it in the fuselage. And that actually creates a very, very stupid thing. You're trying to take a very slender silhouette of a wing, make it as light as possible, and lift a very heavy egg in the middle. This is a design that would make airplanes clap, any airplane. And obviously, you try to avoid it. The way to avoid it that we kind of contemplated was to create the lifting body, to make the fuselage participate in the lift. And around 20% of the lift of this shape is created by the fuselage. It alleviates some of the uh, loads on the structure, but not less important, it also creates those cheeks on the side that gives us that extra volume needed. So that's where the battery goes. You'll see it in a few minutes. 
Our plane, um, this is actually a, a picture of the plane taxiing. It's around uh, 75 or 80 knots. And, and that's another thing to remember. When building what's called the sea toll, there are some huge benefits if you are a battery, but the complexity and the testing needed just to get to the point that this is safe enough to fly is significant like any other program. And it's extremely high energy. We move that 16,500 pound aircraft at up to 110 knots on the ground and then take it take off with it. So that's a, that's a thing to look at. Speaking of all of those crash tests, belly landings, and whatever you can think of, any clever way to mistreat a battery. Um, I really could relate to Herman's videos. Um, I, I'll show you one of our own. How do you build a plane? Well, with partners. Um, Aviation's been working with um, these industry leaders for years, developing everything around the flight control computers with Honeywell, um, building the production, um, let's say, tooling and, and systems for the wing uh, with GKN, the guys that they did the wing for the A350. Um, we're using motors by a company called Magni X uh, down here in Everett, Washington. Um, we use a lot of systems by Parker. And I think the centerpiece here in the middle that people usually do not recognize because that they're not from that industry is AVL. AVL is our test organization. It's an Austrian uh, multinational. And they are the test organization for battery development. So that, that company has a lot of experience in building powertrains for both more traditional uh, auto industry and uh, for the battery world. And we've been leveraging some of their expertise to do our cell level, um, let's say, modeling or, or at least um, fact finding. And I think one of the reasons I said uh, I wanna be on this panel is because of Kuberg. Um, now, one of the beautiful things about experience in, in this industry is that we've all been talking about that threshold that, you know, Let's do 400 watt hour per kilogram, It'd be awesome. Well, I've been in this industry for quite a while and I've been working for the auto industry a bit before that. And I literally found the chart that unfortunately I, I can't share because it's proprietary for the, um, sorry, for the, for the guy that made it, that showed that promise of the 400 watt hour per kilogram back in 2005 saying, you know, by 2010, NMC 811 is gonna get there. That's only wait for that, It'll be okay. And I found it again in 2012 by Nissan saying, yeah, oh, by, by 2020, we're gonna be there. Don't worry about it. It's, it's solid slash high uh, silicon content. We don't know, but one of those. And the joke in the company goes that there are three kinds of liars in the world. There is a liar, there is a big liar, and then there is a battery supplier. And I have to say, Richard, <laughs> that Kubrick is not like that because they actually claim what they can do. And we've been testing with those uh, cells. I don't think there is a cell manufacturer on this good earth that hasn't got a visit and uh, an order for a bunch of cells from us. And we didn't go testing with. But um, unfortunately, cell companies do not die in the lab. They die scaling. And we've seen it throughout the industry development efforts with A123, with um, NVIA, now Zen Labs, and with many other attempts over the years that were less famous, uh, but not less painful. And I think it is an extremely difficult problem, not just to hit the numbers, but to hit price and to scale. And one of the beautiful things that's happening with the way Kubert's taken it is actually that collaboration with Northvolt, obviously still yet to be proven. And obviously I'm still designing my battery around the uh, 21700 cells because I need 43,000 cells per plane um, and not everybody can deliver. So it's a challenge and it's a huge challenge to see mature to the point that we can actually say, yeah, we can use this cell, let's, let's go for it. And, and that's really where we're at today. What you see here is obviously the number of fasteners holding the battery in place. Um, as I said, it's a big one. This is what our battery looks like conceptually. This is where it sits in the aircraft. So we have three logical battery units that are identical from an electrical 
uh, perspective, but not very much from a mechanical perspective. The piece you saw under the fuselage is the left-hand side. You can see it's a mirror image between left-hand side and right-hand side. So it's under the belly, if you will, or under the um, cabin. That takes two thirds of the battery. And we have an aft battery that takes up another third of the total energy. The energy, the system voltage is nominal 800 and it connects to three major systems, to the two motors, to our um, home built, let's say uh, environmental control system. So it's a, an integrated thermal management system that does both the cooling of motors and battery and the heating of batteries if needed and the heating of people and everything needs to, that needs to be done. That's also an 800 volt system. And it connects through an array of DC to DC converters to our uh, 270 and 28 volt system to allow for the other, um, well, to the rest of the aircraft to operate. So our aircraft is the first all electric commuter aircraft out there. It's also the heaviest, but it's also the first part 23, which is a category of certification of light aircraft. It's the first part 23 all fly by wire aircraft. And that means that we can't lose power ever. If we lose power, it doesn't even fall like a rock. It falls like a plane, which is worse. The idea is that we can always rely on one of those three battery packs. They're completely redundant. Each of them can fly the plane actually quite significantly and safely. So they survive. They work through a DC to DC set of converters, so some redundancy there. And they feed into a small array of smaller batteries, 28 volt and 270 volt buffers, that will give us an in uninterruptible low power supply, no matter what, meaning even if the high voltage somehow fails and you don't have propulsion, you will still have buffers that will allow control of the aircraft. So this is a very, very critical system, obviously, not just because it's fuel, because it feeds everything. Each of those areas is built into ribs. Those ribs are our module. Um, I have to say, I don't completely buy into the concept of one single module to fit all, mostly because I haven't seen it yet. Uh, I've seen a lot of attempts out there in the last seven years. Uh, unfortunately, none actually worked for us. So we built our own. Uh, we have a very, very weirdly shaped module. It contains 21,700 cells. As Herman um, mentioned, the right thing to do is not to put the cell in the direction of crashing. <laughs> so uh, we got to the same conclusion as you can see here, but obviously uh, very, very different from other perspectives. We're using five amp hour cells today because they're readily available. And we have uh, two battery packs. So we, we, again, we build big. So when we test something, it's the pack. We do have two battery packs with 5.2 amp hour cells that are beginning to be available in the market right now, which is nice, it's an improvement. Total usable energy in this pack is 820 kilowatt hours. So you do the math. It's, it's basically a pile of 10 Teslas. And it's, it weighs accordingly, 3,700 kilograms, or as I said before, uh, roughly half of our max takeoff weight. From a C rating perspective, we're actually the best customer you can imagine. We cruise at roughly 0.4 C. We take off at roughly 0.9 to 1 C. And even in an emergency condition, a, a rejected, um, rejected landing that requires a high power um, kind of back in the air situation, we are uh, looking at roughly 1.5 C from, from a situation where we lost part of the battery. So from an amperage perspective, not as bad. The system is capable to go all the way up to 3000 uh, amps, which sizes a lot of components that we had to build ourselves just because they either do not exist or were built for rail and that's heavy. The battery itself has a lot of provisions for structure, for venting, for cooling. And I will kind of talk about DO311A for a second year again. Uh, the standard for how to certify a battery is more or less understood, the testing of it is a bit more challenging, but I think the, the connecting lines are very simple. You need to build a battery that will not propagate fire 
and will be able to exhaust the energy of a thermal runaway in the case where it happens to a certain number of cells. Now, there are arguments between different territories. If you need to burn all the cells in a module, just two of them, five strategically picked, it doesn't really matter. There is a thermal runaway event. You need to prove you can survive. Those big vents modeled on the bottom of the, this battery packet you can see are actually the way we get rid of energy. So huge vents, roughly the size of a basketball, to get energy and fumes out when and if something like this happens, and then to hold it at the single cassette level, meaning every one of those ribs can uh, kind of withstand the heat and can get rid of the energy as needed. Sorry, but no pictures for this. There's way too much IP <laughs> built into this one. Um, the other side of this is how do you get energy density slightly better? And the answer is structural integration. So our battery packs are, as you can see, built as ribs. They carry much of the pressurization load of the inner tube that actually holds the cabin, the people. And they make sure that we can uh, withstand the difference in pressurizing the cabin. They also hold some of the uh, lateral loads on the skin. So kind of making other structural parts of the aircraft less heavy. So kind of cheating our way into a higher energy density uh, capability. That means it is not as simple. And speaking of a lot of questions that usually come in, why not replace batteries? Let's talk about charging. Charging is less of a problem than people think. It's an infrastructure challenge. There is plenty to do, but it's doable. Today, we charge um, an hour in the air for about half an hour on the ground, and we can actually do better than that. We charge it anywhere between 500 and 700 kilowatt. The standards that are coming online soon will go all the way up to 900 kilowatt, but the 500 kilowatt mark is actually good enough for most of our missions and our clients. It's good enough for turnaround time. And if we go to 700, we even beat what they ask for. So that's usually not the issue. A plane that size and that weight will usually have many things to wait for. The time it takes to load it, to unload it, to clean it, the time it takes for brakes to cool. When you land a plane this size, you usually wait for about 10 to 20 minutes for the braking system to cool so you can safely brake again. So there are a lot of operational concerns that have a lot to do with the aircraft. And that kind of time frame and turnaround time allows you to plan for reasonable charging. Battery swapping, especially if that battery is structural, We'll take a geometrical miracle, and we believe is the wrong way to, do it, to go. This is what the battery looked like eventually. It's a big piece. You bring it in. Why on earth would we do this? So the reason to build an electric plane is very simple. There is a huge market out there today. I am one that thinks that while electric propulsion can and will revolutionize the way we travel, it will do it because of its economical viability, not just because of the fact it's sustainable. Sustainability is super important for our relationship with our planet, and it's also super important for the way we look into the future. But at the end, what needs to drive this is economy. And the market is there for a 500-mile tool to take you far and fast. And that's a replacement market for existing planes of that size, but it's also to take a chunk away from those 737s and A320s that are being used for short range. I actually think that when we look at the VTOL world, there is definitely great potential for revolution there. But I like to look at these markets first within the regulatory environment and the operational environment of the business models that actually work. A VTOL is a helicopter that doesn't make as much noise and doesn't spew as much and hopefully costs way less. The same goes for the Alice. We get to decarbonize, but we also get to reduce the direct operating cost by anywhere between 30 and 70%. And that's because of the cost of energy and because of the cost of maintenance. And the cost of maintenance really is the main driver for the understanding of what this industry will be able to pay for a kilowatt hour. It's not as sensitive as the auto industry, but it is sensitive to an extent. On top of that, you get lower noise and it gets you to open up just new airports and new um, areas that were not reasonable for flight so far. So that should grow the pie 
And yeah, I do wish to see thousands of planes like this flying around soon enough. So what do we need from our future battery cells? Um, as I said, today we're using cells that, are, that start their life at roughly 270 watt hour per kilogram and go down to around 260, 255 when we finish our thousand cycles. We do not love it. It's a cylindrical cell, 21700, and it is readily available from the auto industry. We're piggybacking, and that's what there is in this volume. Do we see a beginning of a change there? Yes. Can we do pouches? Absolutely. We build those packs in different shapes and sizes. That's why we're working with, uh, with Kuberg like we do with many other um, battery companies. We would like to see anything over 300 watt hour per kilogram because it allows us to go further and carry more. Now, we obviously would like to see more than 400, 500, 1,000. Whatever someone can give us, we can wrap our heads around. But the question really becomes, do we have a range issue? And my answer is, no, we don't, not, not according to our clients. Flying 440 nautical is more than enough in a cabin this size. It doesn't cover 99% of uh, aviation missions, but it covers around 75%. And that's huge. That's more than enough. So the question really becomes, if I can make a battery that weighs, a battery pack that is, that weighs 50% of what my battery pack weighs right now, because we just did a 2x improvement in cell energy density, would I take it and would it immediately translate to higher, um, um, let's say payload, effective payload as we call it? And the answer is, well, it's not that simple. Center of gravity in an aircraft is a tricky thing. And we, once designing an, air, an airframe, are committing to something that is extremely difficult to change. So there is roughly a 10% margin we can play with, meaning I can take a 10 or 20% um, drop in the weight of the battery and directly replace it with more cargo or more people. But anything beyond that becomes a different aircraft. And I think we need to remember that when we build airframes, we build them for 25, 30, 35 years. That's actually the average age of planes out there today. So what we did to accommodate this was to create what's called a TSO, meaning the battery has its own certification effort. And it's a unit that you can, in a maintenance procedure, replace. So one day, hopefully with Kuberg or with other players, when new and different batteries incrementally improve what we have today, we can definitely create a new battery. But we will aim to actually pack a fairly similar weight and just give the, the plane more range. That would be more likely the scenario we're going to see. From a thermal runaway perspective, I wish we could have a cell that doesn't burn ever. But I do not believe this will be the case in the foreseeable future. So mostly we need to see predictability. And that goes to quality assurance. And that goes to manufacturing process. And that kind of goes to my next point as well. Consistent manufacturing quality. The advantage of those huge manufacturers is that they make many, many millions of cells a week. So cell number one and cell number 40,000, sorry, 43,626 is very similar. And if you can control this, your ability to model, predict, and build safe systems increases exponentially. If you have surprises all the time, it's extremely difficult to build a safe system and you need to take huge margins and those create something that's less usable. So the balance needs to be struck, not just around performance, but around the ability to manufacture a coherent uh, set and then to, to actually model it correctly. Reliable future availability is also um, a huge thing. When we built our plane that you saw a picture of just a minute ago, um, we built it throughout 2020 and 2021. We are going to fly it in 2022, three, four, and five, because it's a prototype. A client of mine will probably take his delivery of a plane in 2024, and will like to fly it also in 2044. Will I be able to get cells, even if I don't want to change anything, all the way out a decade from now? The answer needs to be yes or very close to it. 
So there are issues here about how can we predict what's going on next. And then reasonable price, we're talking about roughly $200 per kilowatt hour at the cell level, um, mostly because we believe we can pay two or three times what the, auto, what the auto industry is paying. More than that kind of breaks the mold for other reasons. But again, that's, that's probably not the discussion here. Um, so what's the problem? Because it seems like, okay, so Coburg's working on it. Northvolt's going to manufacture it. Don't worry about it. We're done. Um, I'll, I'll show you what we're playing with most times. This is actually a, a thermal runaway event that went wrong. This is actually only eight cells. Um, I don't think the sound is very important here, but the picture is very clear. Uh, this is, by the way, liquid cooled, and the liquid cooling system just couldn't take it. Um, this gets way worse, so wait. So when batteries burn, they burn hot. This burn was recorded. It's not Kubrick cells, I, I have to say. You guys do way better. But uh, this is a high silicon content uh, cell that burned at roughly 1,015 degrees C. So extremely hot and extremely hard to contain with anything. And we're testing a lot to make sure that we don't get this. We get um, all sorts of uneventful poofs and try to keep it that way. And it's all about cooling quickly and aggressively and venting, venting, venting. So there is plenty to do in terms of the design and safety is obviously paramount. It is, we're building a commuter aircraft. The aviation industry today is the safest mode of transport ever developed by mankind. And if we don't keep to that standard, we're out of the business. So that's the challenge. Manufacturing, as I said before, that's not just on the cell size, but also on the um, pack size uh, side, sorry. It's extremely challenging. It needs to be done um, in a very, very controlled manner. Cost is obviously a big deal at the end of the game. The driving force for this market and for the adoption of these new tools will be they're making economic sense. And if we break that mold too far, we just can't do anything. We'll have to wait till it drops or just piggyback on the auto industry that's actually doing a very good job in uh, kind of racing to the bottom on the sell size and sell uh, price. In terms of real energy density, one of the biggest considerations we look at today is not just what can this cell do? But what, what will this cell need in order for it not to burn like the, these cells burned? So how far do the gaps need to be? How big the cooling system needs to be? How hard do you need to apply pressure on these pouches, for example, to get the electrical characteristics and the repeatability of performance that is needed? That will create a true apples to apples comparison between um, a pouch cell of any size to um, let's say an array of cylindricals. And that combination of factors is really what drives our decision-making going forward. Um, as I said, we have built for pouches at the range of around 12 amp hours. Um, and we have obviously built for a cylindrical. So we have some ex experience with both, but I do accept, uh, Richard, your, your comment completely that building anything over uh, 25 or 30 amp hours becomes to be um, very challenging. It's very hard to get rid of the energy in a thermal runaway event of a single cell or two cells. And, and you really create this um, huge amount of, um, of, of uh, heat and, and pressure to evacuate. So we never built for anything bigger than that, but we do believe that we can handle anything up to 15 amps uh, quite easily within the, the realm of what we're doing in a day-to-day -day basis. But again, size matters and an 800 or let's say age kind of edging towards a megawatt hour of uh, of battery in terms of nominal capacity is is challenging from both a manufacturing perspective a thermal management perspective and obviously uh, uh just sheer sheer testing um i don't have a slide here about the charging but i do want to add a small comment about that um, today, one of our understandings is that while we do leverage auto industry standards for charging, we just use two CCS cables to get what we need. Um, 
in the long run, we're probably going to look at either kind of future standards of auto adopting um, more rigorous standards so that they would fit the aviation industry better. And I think I'm beginning to see the same thing in the auto industry in general. So if the aviation industry does not suffer a thermal runway as an event you can live with, both in, in kind of the operation of the aircraft, but also uh, around charging and its challenges, the auto industry usually looks at the thermal runway as a question of how bad is it? Meaning there is a question of uh, what's called the um, graceful uh, burn or the graceful thermal runaway, which means if I can give you five or 10 minutes to get out of the car and then the car burned, it's not so bad. Obviously it doesn't quite work for airplanes. And I think what we're, be we're beginning to see is a high level of interest by the uh, auto industry into the practices and experience gathered by companies like our own uh, in creating the um, non-propagation solutions out there. And I think what we're going to see from a systems perspective is a bit more of a convergence because it's going to be important enough to both the auto industry and the aviation industry to make sure that these, um, these uh, packs are bulletproof, uh, pun intended, because the defense industry also cares a lot and there's plenty of learning to be done there as well. So I think there's plenty of multi-industry um, learning to be had. And that's all I had to say. Uh, I'll be happy to take questions. Omer, thank you very much um, for, the, for the talk. And I think we are running a little bit in, late in time. So let me just suggest we go to the panel discussion and incorporate some of the questions from our audience there. Sure, and I just want to say one thing is um, here at Stanford, we, we really talk about this from atoms to systems integration. Uh, we talk about it, we work on some of it, but it's really exciting to see how um, the three of you are embracing this uh, really just across the materials level, the cell level and module level. And thank you for speaking to that today, learned a lot. So maybe I will kick off um, with a question inspired by Richard's um, back of the envelope estimation. So Richard, you, you highlighted that the cost requirement is much less strict than for electric vehicles. And this relaxes a lot of constraints and Herman and Omer, you also alluded to that in your talk. And in my mind, I see sort of two things that you can do differently because of that relaxation. One is you can embrace expensive technology. And number two, you can also embrace very low yield technology. And this makes me think of semiconductors, right? So as you introduce new semiconductor processing, the yield is always very low, but you can make something. And so I wanted to ask the three of you to sort of comment on what technology you see in both camps, something that is very expensive and impractical in terms of cost for EVs or other applications, and something that has very low yield, uh, but when it works, it can, uh, it can deliver what you need. Uh, maybe I can ask Richard to start. Um, sure. I, I... So, so in my mind, you know, one example would be actually on the module design, where, for instance, heavy use of carbon fiber is something that we anticipate happening in aviation modules. And it's something that I'm not really sure would be viable for a mass market uh, passenger vehicle, but it has large benefits in terms of propagation containment as well as, as light weighting. So that would be one example off the top of my head. I have to, if I can jump in, I have to not only agree, it's... Um... We build our composite, so our uh, modules are even more exotic than carbon fiber. <laughs> it's a combination of Kevlar ceramic. Um, there are plenty of, of insane materials that, you know, once out there make a way better, um, make for a way better combination of both thermal management and uh, load bearing. And, and that's usually the combination that we're looking for. Totally agree. Same answer. <laughs> In an <laughs> aircraft, you would sell your mother to save 10 kilograms. <laughs> so if it something technology that is very um, weight savings or promotes safety, as Omar mentioned, some of these Kevlar's or ballistic materials are very useful with ceramics. So if they're low yield technologies, that's okay, because we're willing to pay the premium for safety and weight savings. And in some cases, they're reusable, meaning the yeah, the batteries go away, the cells, but the pack can be recycled. So even from a yield perspective, sometimes you can actually um, kind of build the ecosystem in a way that's not that bad. Uh, Omar and Herman, on the, 
on the engineering, the mechanical engineering side, are you already seeing some benefit in the non-battery structural weight um, of the aircraft by using the battery as a structural component? Are you saving elsewhere outside of the battery? Battery is a structural component. Uh, maybe Omar, you could speak to that because you had it more integrated, right? Yeah, so for us, absolutely. Uh, we dropped, so the, the weight of the fuselage um, will be dropped, well, not will be dropped, but on this fuselage that you saw in the pictures, is actually 5% uh, lower, almost 5%, 4 point something, um, than what it would have been if we had to build it without a battery and then add a battery. So there is, and it's mostly about just replacing ribs. So if you come to think about it, if you look at kind of a conceptual design of any aircraft, you have this double bubble concept, right? You have a bubble on the inside and a bubble on the outside, and there are um, ribs along the way. So I showed you a picture of roughly 24, not roughly, exactly 24 ribs. Um, probably from a mechanical perspective, an optimized number would be closer to six or seven ribs for, for a piece that long. So 24 is not optimal, but still it's better than zero, and it's better than having a battery and then having your six optimal ribs holding it. So we saved around just around 5% of the weight of the fuselage there. And we did not. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have uh, batteries, for example, that are mechanically separate from the fuselage, and we didn't want to take credit for that. And we thought it'd be easier path to certification to verify, validate the design, and so to have separate batteries, separate fuselage. And we wanted, you know, just for future growth, we thought we could just, you know, change the batteries in the future to different or upgraded. So we took a different path. We're paying the 5% fuselage hit. Things like that. So yeah. Yeah, it's it's an evolving, emerging industry. So the answers aren't always obvious or, or uh, known. The, the correct answers are the best answers. And so there'll be a lot of different approaches to uh, design and manufacture. Absolutely. And you know, one of the challenges I, I really appreciate, uh, I, I love the design that Beta um, puts forward mostly because of its simplicity. And, and I think one of the interesting considerations we didn't kind of, that weren't as trivial is that at the end, you know, we all need to crash test. And, and when you do say, okay, this is all integrated, it means that in every test, you're gonna sacrifice probably another fuselage. And that's very painful. Um, on the other hand, it does create all sorts of unique opportunities. For example, we did have a kill beam that we figured will be, you know, just for belly landing protection when we designed the first fuselage before integrating. And then we created the kill, uh, if you could have seen it in the pictures, I guess, so the two internal walls of the battery packs uh, are actually those huge aluminum um, ribs. We barely have aluminum uh, on the plane. And the reason is that that's actually the, the new kill beam. So it kind of opens up new design opportunities. But yes, there is a, a significant price to pay. And obviously, anything you do adds complexity. So, so that's always a consideration. Well, both of you, um, actually all three of you alluded to battery safety and uh, E is uh, Mr. Battery Safety here at Stanford leading many programs and exciting progress. Uh, e, would you like to uh, ask the next question perhaps along the lines of safety? Yeah, I'm thinking about safety for sure. I mean, three of your talks, um, all uh, these all get emphasized, right? <laughs> safety certainly has the going from the inside the battery cell internally all the way to the whole system you can put in safety enhancement uh ideas right there um now giving the and the uh, uh air mobility requires such high safety compared to anything else i really want you to see, uh, ask you anything or maybe stop on which right inside the cell i mean lithium metal certainly i mean the safety instance uh what 40 years ago still very clear in people's mind and what can you do to enhance that and then, then certainly for omar and uh, herman right then when you pack your cell together what are the strategies what new things would you like to see if you you can share with the audience yeah richard maybe start from you yeah so it's something we think about a lot. And, and I think there's kind of two different ways to, to look at it. One is really from a s internal materials and cell level, how do you make it as reliable as, as possible and, and redundant in terms of failure modes? And then the other one is really the mechanical design of the module that itself needs to be certified. Uh, and that's more, uh, le that's less about sort of probability of runaway and more about like just 
the nature of the runway, how the heat gets released. So I think um, for the cell, you know, some things we look at, for example, are you know one of these concepts is with these like um, aluminized uh, plastic current collector um, that has a shutdown feature and and it can defeat internal short circuits uh, hypothetically. And, and this kind of thing, I, I'm not sure like it will do anything from like a certification perspective, but really from a practical safety perspective, I think it'll be quite profound in terms of really uh, avoiding internal short circuit as the key mode of, of cell failure. Um, I think the other piece of this is really developing much more robust data systems. And again, you know, FAA is kind of behind on software. They, they don't like a very advanced software being a safety system. Um, if they don't understand how it works, this is my understanding. Uh, but, but like really from like a maintenance and operations perspective, being able to understand degradation modes in a much, much better fashion using electrochemical data you get from your pack, I think has, has huge value. And then once you move to the modules side, that's really where we talk about, you know, containing the size of the cells, re reducing the amount of heat that comes out um, when your cell does go into thermal runaway, slowing down the, the rate of, of uh, heat release as well, I think are some variables we, we look at. Yeah, Richard, maybe let me just resonate back, uh, back to the materials inside the cell level. Uh, something we saw is uh, adding the fire retardant type of uh, chemicals in there, of course, into electrolyte, they will be limited right there. A couple of years ago, so we started to use, you mentioned aluminized uh, plastics as current collector. We actually started to put uh, uh, fire retardant into that plastics for the current collector. Once there's something going on, you know, certain temperature, 100, 150 degrees C, you can release that and has the safety. So that's what it has not been done testing in a very big cell, but I can appreciate, you know, the idea fundamentally in the materials and chemistry level, if you can make it safe, right? You ultimately made the whole system a very safe. Um, yeah, uh, maybe to Herman and Omar, if you want to make comment on the uh, module and the system level. Yeah, I would love to. <laughs> we could throw out a wish list, please, you know, do all these things. <laughs> but I think the fundamental objective is to make the cell failure, its expression as least violent as possible, because then it's so much easier to manage the subsequent cascading events. So to slow down the energy release, the exotherms, the release of electrolyte, the vaporization, the burning of it, you know, trying to just make it slower. Uh, because we have challenges when it's really fast, really violent. It's really hard to contain. It's hard to manage the, from a pressure, a thermodynamics point of view. So paying attention to what goes into every cell. Can we add separators? Can we add intumescence? Can we add, you know, all these uh, little mechanisms that help to shut off the cell during failure? I think that's great. But it's also the highest risk place because that's where all your chemistry is happening. You know, so it's a great challenge, a wonderful challenge. Uh, so worthy of attention. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I think I, I think if we can make it just burn not as hot, it would make such a huge difference. If we can make it burn not for two seconds, but for three, it would make a huge difference. But uh, kind of to kind of just reiterate the last point that uh, that you made, Herman. I think we need to let cells be cells <laughs> and do your best, get the energy density, get the manufacturing right, get availability right, get the price right. We'll pack it. <laughs> We've been packing terrible cells for a while. Well, th thanks, Omar. I, it just to mention to you, I remember several years ago when Steve Chu and I pr uh, brainstormed about how to make a cell safe, right? The idea is if you can detect that problem cell, can you release that? Does, the energy of that cell out. So exactly try to realize what you said, not so not burn so hot. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe yeah, this is a system yeah. level, you can engineer something in, right? Detect the, the problem of the cell and release the energy somewhere, dissipate it. Yeah. Exactly. Please no thousand degrees C. It's not a target. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would like to add one subtlety here. It's always nice to make safer cells. But the aviation is so sensitive to safety, they will always push us to a point of uh, multiple cell failure because it could happen. Because they are not going to believe you if they say, oh, our cells are benign. Don't worry. No, no. Make them fail, push them to a uh, cascade, and then show us that you can contain it. And so that's really the, the 
uh, the modus operandi of battery engineering in the aviation industry. We will push the cells to failure. It may take triggering 10 of them simultaneously, but we must show that cascade and then show that the battery can contain it and or exit the flame safely out of, out of a port external to the aircraft. I think there were some questions in the uh, chat that uh, address that as well. I actually want to uh, briefly highlight one of uh, Stanford's uh, a very interesting work led by my colleague, Simona Onori. So she's been developing a failure early warning system in the battery management system. So the ability to look forward and then see if probabilistically something is coming along the way. So this seems to have, um, could have profound impact for aviation because then you can do something about it. For cars is a little bit less so because then um, you know, take it to the shop. Uh, but here, I think the stakes are much higher. Um, Omar and, and Herman and Rich, I want to build on East Point again about the cell level safety features. But I actually want to go one level deeper to the materials level safety feature and the cathode and anode and the electrolyte. Uh, the way I see it fundamentally, um, you have two problems, right? The electrolyte is flammable and the cathode is a source of oxygen. So here's kind of a naive question for me. In terms of a good balance between energy density, power density, and safety, it's lithium cobalt oxide, right? This is also why the consumer electronics industry has really honed in on that, a cobalt-rich composition. If cost is not an issue, uh, has that received attention at the cell level for testing in the, in, in the, in the aviation um, uh, industry? I, I haven't seen it. Um, we've considered uh, uh, LCO. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have not used it because because at least my impression of LCO is it has quite good volumetric energy density, but it can't compete on specific energy with nickel rich NMC. Um, uh, the other issue also is that the voltage tends to be higher to get to, you know, uh, they charge to higher voltages for consumer electronics, which makes it more difficult for electrolyte design as well when you're trying to design a high energy system. Um, so uh, I, I haven't seen much momentum on, on the LCO side, to be honest. I think something worth to think about because ultimately these um, um, very, um, you know, these big fires um, is caused by, it's triggered by the oxygen release from the cathode. So, you know, initially you have a small fire, that's the electrolyte burning by itself and decomposing. And then you have this amazing fire and that's because oxygen decides to come out. And, uh, you know, Richard, as you know, for the nickel rich cathode, this is a real challenge. It comes out about 200 degrees C. Uh, but for something much safer, um, say lithium iron phosphate is 600 degrees C, and uh, cobalt uh, is somewhere in between. That's what I, I thought it could be an interesting way to consider the availability of oxygen during a thermal runaway. Um, yeah, I think it, it takes a hit uh, in energy, but it's all about trade-offs, as, as all three of you commented today. So I think it's maybe something that um, is wor worthwhile thinking also, how do you stop the oxygen from coming into the combustion process. So one, if I may comment, and, and my apologies for a change of scenery, but uh, we're always on the move, right? Uh, it, I think one of the things we experimented with quite extensively, and I think we will, well, we're not using right now, but we probably will use in the future, is um, just replacing oxygen with nitrogen in the area of uh, burn. So we had an interesting exper set of experiments with uh, high pressure nitrogen uh, additions to the pack that burst locally where you have a thermal runaway event. And we found that in several, in several different chemistries, we found that the results were very encouraging in just in, in kind of lowering the peaks in just creating a, a more subtle burn. It doesn't prevent uh, the burn itself, but it does uh, help prevent propagation. So uh, I think that's definitely an issue. But much like was said here before, thus far, we haven't been able to find um, a cell that did not rely on NMC uh, and even specifically NMC H11 and, and worse, I would say, uh, to get anywhere near the energy density we need. The other kind of materials point we've observed is that thermal runaway is, is still you know, enormously poorly understood, both academically and industrially. And there's a lot of non-obvious interplays that you don't see until you're actually driving big cells in a runaway. Like uh, non-flammable electrolytes, I would say, have both benefits and issues in terms of safety. It's actually a trade-off. It's not an obvious, just simple win. Uh, and, and the reason is typically they're more thermally stable. So you can push your onset temperature higher, which is good, uh, absolutely good. But because these are thermally more stable uh, solvents and salts, they have much stronger chemical bonds. 
And then when that electrolyte eventually does combust and those chemical bonds break, you actually release a lot more energy quickly because of that, the, uh, those stable bonds. So you have this very sort of non-intuitive trade-off and like what balance of chemical stability and flammability or, or vapor pressure is actually ideal for optimizing that, that runaway uh, release. It, it's, it's quite a complex uh, trade. Well put, Richard. Maybe I can, maybe for the last few minutes, um, take, um, ask um, the PAC experts here. You know, one thing that's sort of catching attention in the EV industry is using multiple chemistries in one pack uh, to deliver the power, the energy, low temperature performance, and so forth. Um, has this been examined for aviation? Um, multiple energy storage technologies within a battery pack or within a energy storage system. Uh, let me just um, say multiple chemistry. Yeah, multiple. Yeah, that, that, some people call that dual energy storage technology, where there's a dual component, usually a high power element and then a high energy element. Um, if, for example, EV tall aircraft, a lot of the initial concepts said, oh, yeah, we're going to have a dual one for takeoff and one for cruise. And once you get done with all the analysis and all the additional packaging and all the additional power conversion and inefficiency of processing, et cetera, it doesn't pay off. You're better off with a large battery of one technology because it's large, it's much easier to then achieve the power density goals. Um, so it's only in those applications that truly have a bifurcation between the high power short duration events and low power long duration events that that really gets uh, far apart Then those topologies or tech, uh, applications can use a dual energy or a dual technology source. But for these applications, it, it looks like we're, we're just going to go with that one uh, high power and high energy cell. <laughs> It's a nice combination, actually. It's very attractive. The technology that Kubrick's developing is uh, it, it answers the both ends of the spectrum. I do have to uh, depart, but I've been so enjoyed my participation in this. Uh, so I appreciate Stanford hosting us and having a chance to share our challenging application with so many creative minds, because there are a lot of challenges that still need to be solved. Well, I took a lot of notes. I'm sure our audience did it as well. And Herman, Richard, and Omer, thank you very much for taking uh, time out of your busy day to speak with us. Um, let me ask um, Kaylee for the final slides. Um, we have several exciting talks coming up. Uh, we have two more talks scheduled. Uh, we're going to hear from Jessica Tresek to talk about uh, energy storage at the systems level and also Nicola um, Camarillo from uh, McKinsey, who will also discuss the Chinese market at a systems level for lithium-ion batteries. And then following that, uh, we're going to have uh, two very exciting talks from our battery management and battery informatics experts, uh, Simona Nori and, and Dirk Gorsurier from AHA University. And that's a good connection to today's talk as well on next generation battery management. So with that, um, thank you everyone for tuning in to our first uh, session for 2022. And we hope to see you in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye.